Hello everyone and welcome back. Now in the previous video I introduced you to the method of characteristics. And what we saw is that for these linear first order partial differential equations, essentially what happens is you take the initial profile and you start moving it through space, right? Now, what we would like to do is we would like to apply the method of characteristics to the wave equation as well and take a look at maybe what, what we can find and what this tells us about the behavior of the wave equation. Because we've already got a pretty good grip on the wave equation as it is. I suspect if you made it this far in this lecture series, you are nearly an expert on the wave equation. What do solutions do? They wiggle, right? They sort of oscillate in time according to either a Fourier series or a Fourier transform, depending on if space is finite or infinite. Let's try and reclassify. Let's take a, a different perspective on these things. And so here's where I'm going to start again with the wave equation. Same place we started in the previous video. I am going to use just the simple linear constant speed wave equation here. And you'll remember that I decomposed, you know, I, I did a little factoring in the pre at the beginning of the previous video, and I factored this to get two different equations. So here were the equations that I had. I had partial with respect to W is, e uh, sorry, partial W with respect to T plus C partial W with respect to X. Uh, this is equal to zero. And partial V with respect to T minus C partial V with respect to X is also equal to zero. Remember, this is how I got my first order equations at the beginning of the last video. Okay, but also where did W and V come from? Remember that I defined them to be W was equal to, this was the partial derivative of the original solution. Right? It was, so it was related, uh, sorry, here's a, a u, pardon me, and an x, right? And v was sort of analogously built, partial t plus c partial u partial x, right? Well, here's the thing. I know what u and v look like. Right? Because, uh, sorry, W and V, because they're solutions to this equation, right? So if I have an initial profile for, say, W and for V, then, so if W of X comma zero is equal to P of X, and uh, V of X comma zero is equal to Q of X, let's just use P and Q here, they could be different. This tells me that W is just P of X minus CT because C is constant again. And V is Q of X plus CT, right? So be careful. There's these, uh, there are these uh, changes of sign, right? So you have to be careful. This is a, left, a rightward moving wave, right? Everything's being shifted to the right. This is a leftward moving wave. Everything's being shifted to the left. Okay, so that means that this, this partial differential equation right here is equal to P. This partial differential equation is equal to Q. Now what I can do is I can try and isolate the partial derivatives with respect of U with respect to X. So combining these things. Now, I'm going to let you fill in the gaps here. I want you to think about this. But you get 2 times the partial derivative of U with respect to T has to be equal to p of x minus ct plus q of x minus uh, plus ct, right? Just add these two equations together and use the fact that you know what w and v are. Similarly, you could get 2c times the partial derivative with respect to x of u, which is going to be q of x plus ct, minus P of X minus CT. Okay. So essentially what we could, what we could conjecture here is that my solution U 
is made up of a leftward, or sorry, a rightward traveling wave and a leftward wave, right? This is rightward progression, this is leftward progression. So what I could do is I could say set u, the original solution to the wave equation, as some function that's moving left, uh, rightward, pardon me, and some function that's moving leftward. Now this original sort of thought process here, I'm not sure if it's exactly the same process, but this was arrived at by a French mathematician named D'Alembert uh, around the middle 1700s, 1747 approximately, okay? So this is uh, when there was a very, very strong French school of people working on partial differential equations. Fourier being one of them, right? But we also had people like Poisson. That's another uh, equation that we've seen already in this lecture series. Uh, but there was a number of very, very strong mathematicians sort of all working and supervised by each other that were working on these problems in partial differential equations. And D'Alembert's big contribution to the mathematical literature is his solutions to the wave equation, which started by assuming that the solution to the wave equation could be decomposed into a leftward and a rightward traveling waves. Okay, so essentially what this would do is if you take these pieces right here, you can see that this will give you that minus C times F prime, the derivative of the original profile F, is equal to one half of P and C times G prime, the derivative right, these are single variable functions, the derivative of g is equal to one half of q. And all that you're doing here is really sort of just matching up profiles and rearranging these two pieces. So what can we get, right? Well, we could say finding f and g. Well, if we have initial conditions, right? Because look at you could get F and G just by knowing P and Q, but we don't really know what P and Q are. We just said, imagine we have initial profiles. That's not how we have the wave equation. The wave equation is given to us with initial conditions on U, right? So remember, you could have something that looks like this, maybe some initial disturbance of the string or whatever it is that you're modeling as well as, because it's second order in time, you need to know what the initial velocity is everywhere in space. We'll just call that function little g of x. So now the question is, how do you find these two pieces, right? Well, let's use this equation right here. If I set time equal to zero, so uh, this implies that u of x comma zero is equal to f of x, right? And then evaluating this, I get f of capital X plus g of capital X. Okay, so bear with me for a second. Similarly, if you do the differentiation here, you are going to get that g of x divided by c, because you're gonna get c's that come out whenever you do the derivatives here, this thing is equal to minus, let's use this, d df dx, and then plus d dg dx, okay? And it just comes from differentiating this thing and evaluating at zero. f and g, they're single valued functions. I'm just using x to represent uh, their, their initial um, argument, right? But you can just put f prime and g prime in here if it makes you a little bit more comfortable. So now, the question is, what can I do with these two things, right? Well, what I could do is I could rearrange and I could identify that um, dg dx is equal to one half of df dx, right? So if I take a derivative right here and then I try and isolate for dg, uh, I get the derivative of the initial condition plus g of x over c, right? 
because when I take the derivative of this thing the, and add these two equations together, the derivatives of capital F disappear, and I'm left with two of these. That's where the one half comes from, which tells me that I could integrate this thing, right? So it's not a, a, a differential equation, right? It's just a straight derivative of this thing is equal to these functions. These are known, right? So in this case, I'm going to get one half of f of x plus one over two c, two and c, and then the antiderivative of zero to x of g of s ds, and then plus some constant of integration k. Okay, so, so I know it's maybe kind of looking a little bit complicated, but, but honestly, it's really just a straight integration. This is just antiderivative, right? Similarly, I can do the same thing for capital F because I can, again, subtract these two equations. I can isolate for the derivative of capital F. And then what I can find is that this thing is going to be equal to 1 half F of X, right? Similarly, because I had to take a derivative to get this derivative here. And then minus 1 over 2C integral from 0 to x of g of s ds, and let's just say minus k here, okay? So the question is, did this help me at all, right? Has anything sort of worked out? Well, yes, right? Because what happened was that g of x and capital F of x, they define the original leftward and rightward waves that are propagating from the original solution of u. But I've been able to write those things in terms of the initial conditions. So in fact, what I can get is what's called d'Alembert, so d'Alembert's um, solution to the wave equation. Right? And I want you to notice that this is different, or it's sort of written differently than, the, than what we would get if we wrote uh, the solution in terms of the Fourier transform. So here, and I think that this is a better way to look at the, the solution to the wave equation because it really decomposes these things into fundamental waves. Wave, wave moving right, wave moving left. So let's take a look. I get f of x plus ct. Remember, I have capital F of x minus ct and g of x plus ct. So here, I get this piece which to my interpretation, I would take this as the average, right, one over two, of the initial condition propagating to the left and propagating to the right. And then combining these derivatives, you can kind of use these minuses to your advantage, and you could just write the whole thing as, again, one, an average, in some sense, of x minus ct, x plus ct of your initial velocity propagating as well, right? So again, this is your initial disturbance of your string. It's moving to the left and to the right. And then similarly, you're sort of looking at antiderivatives here. So the antiderivative of your initial condition for your velocity it is also propagating to the left and to the right, okay? And this right here is what's called d'Alembert's solution. And the important piece of it is that it really adheres to this aspect right here, right? Where we've taken the solution to the wave equation and we've decomposed it into a leftward and a rightward uh, propagating component. I call them traveling waves because they are typically, this is the wave equation. These are things that are traveling left and right. Now, what... This is, you know, this is best case, easiest case scenario. The question is, what happens whenever things get more complicated? Again, one aspect of this is that it is on an infinite line. What happens whenever you're traveling left or right waves hit a boundary, right? So if it's a, if it's a guitar string or something like that, we saw earlier on that we can also de decompose these things in the left and right traveling waves. Now we would like to sort of analyze this thing in terms of d'Alembert's solution. And in the next video, that's what we're gonna come back at. 
and we're going to ask ourselves what happens when you have a boundary in space what happens to these left and right traveling waves do they reflect do they get absorbed how can we analyze these things so that'll be the, the feature of the next video but for now we got introduced to d'Alembert's solution and we have a much better understanding of the wave equation because of it so i'll see you all in the next video everyone